Hi, and welcome to another edition of Your Health with Dr. Christy. My name is Dr. Christy Reisinger, and today we're going to talk about the current treatment options for COVID-19. As we continue to be in the surge from the Omicron variant, I want to give everyone some guidance on what outpatient options there are for treatment if you test positive for COVID-19. The first outpatient treatment that's available after a positive COVID test is monoclonal antibodies. Previously, if you had gotten COVID, you would have received a combination of two medications given at an infusion center through an IV. But now, with the changes to the spike protein on the Omicron variant, only a singular and previously lesser used monoclonal antibody called sotrovimab has been shown to be helpful against Omicron. Monoclonal antibodies must be given within 10 days of symptoms, and you must meet at least one risk factor for high risk disease, such as a BMI greater than 25, being older than 65, or if you have diabetes. See my prior video on monoclonal antibodies for more specific information about them. For those of you that are fully vaccinated, and especially if you've had a booster shot, you're hopefully going to have mild COVID symptoms, so you may not need to pursue monoclonal antibodies. But for those that are unvaccinated, or if you are vaccinated but have lots of risk factors, you may find that you're having quite a few symptoms and monoclonal antibodies would be a great option for you. They quickly can help people to feel better and prevent progression to hospitalization. There are two options to getting this infusion. One is to contact your primary care physician. Often over the phone, they can fill out the necessary paperwork and send it to the infusion center hub who will reach out to you to schedule your appointment. Another option is to try and contact infusion centers directly by going to infusioncenter.org. I do have to tell you that the infusion centers are getting backed up due to demand and a very short supply of sotrovimab. So unfortunately, even if you qualify, you may not be able to get the infusion. The next new outpatient treatment for COVID is a pill called Paxlovid that's recently been given emergency use authorization by the FDA. I talked about this medication at length in another video and gave the data on this medication. But to summarize, Paxlovid is an antiviral that works by stopping an enzyme called protease. So Paxlovid is in a class of medications called protease inhibitors. Patients need to start this medication within five days of having symptoms of COVID and use it twice a day for five days. There are some common medications that should not be used with Paxlovid, like statins for cholesterol, so be sure to discuss what medications you're already taking with your doctor before starting Paxlovid. At this time, Paxlovid is in very short supply and is very difficult to get. Another oral medication that has received emergency use authorization from the FDA for the outpatient treatment of COVID-19 is called molnupiravir. Overall, I'm not very excited about molnupiravir and probably will not prescribe it for reasons that I mentioned in my prior video, which include concerns about mutagenicity or the potential to cause permanent changes in genetic material, and the fact that as it's been used more in the real world, it doesn't seem to be as effective as the original data touted it to be. The next outpatient treatment that's available to you is fluvoxamine. This is an oral medication that's typically used for obsessive compulsive disorder and depression. It's in a class of medication called SSRIs. The recommended dose for treatment in COVID is 100 milligrams twice a day for 10 days. It needs to be started as soon as possible after symptoms, and you should not be taking another medication from the same class of medications, such as Prozac or Zoloft. Please see my other video about this medication for more details. When patients took the medication for the complete course, there was a 70% risk reduction for progression of symptoms leading to hospitalization or death. It is inexpensive and does not have the same political stigma that ivermectin has attached to it. So I'm hopeful that more physicians will be willing to prescribe it and more pharmacies will be willing to fill it. The biggest side effects of this medication is that 25% will have nausea and a small portion of patients may experience acute anxiety when taking it. So you'll need to have a physician checking in with you while you're taking it. And lastly, I really can't have a segment about oral treatments for COVID without mentioning ivermectin. This medication has had so much controversy. Please see my prior videos about this drug. 
I continue to be saddened and alarmed at how the medical community has received this drug and will continue to hope that ongoing trials will be done because I do believe this medication has trending data to show a benefit. When you stack up all the treatments against each other, I thought this was a good chart to help see them all together. Let's look at the relative risk reduction of hospitalization and death. The one outlier seems to be molnupiravir, whose data has not really stood up to the original hype. It's also very expensive. The other medications all seem to have a good risk reduction. Of note, fluvoxamine showed about 30% risk reduction overall, but when the data excluded patients that dropped out of the study early for various reasons, the risk reduction increased to about 70%. Monoclonal antibodies have had excellent efficacy in the past, but we don't have any specific data for how well they work with Omicron because the main issue with them is that they can be greatly affected by changes in the spike protein from variants. Furthermore, they are costly and require an infusion center to administer it. In the end, I will continue to have concerns that medications that will not provide a large profit to the pharmaceutical companies are not getting the attention they deserve, and I will continue to do my best to spotlight them the best I can. This really is an institutional problem within our medical system. Thanks for joining me.